and good evening, everyone. I'm Brad Stewart, and I'm the Vice President and Provost of the Tacoma Park Silver Spring Campus of Montgomery College. And I am extremely pleased to be here tonight uh, to welcome all of you and our honored guest, King Peggy, to Montgomery College in partnership with the Maryland Humanities Council and their One Maryland, One Book program. In its sixth year, and I believe you guys have been here for four years, uh, the last four years, uh, this program has brought people, diverse people across the state together through the shared experience of reading the same book. Readers are invited to participate in book-centered discussions at public libraries, high schools, community colleges, and universities, museums, bookstores, community and senior centers. We're trying to get to everybody. This shared experience resonates with me particularly because we here at Montgomery College gather diverse people, students, faculty, and staff uh, from around the globe uh, in pursuit of education and a brighter future. As global citizens, we all learn from each other, just as we gather tonight to be thrilled and inspired by King Peggy and her incredible journey. Now I'm especially pleased to be able to introduce you to Phoebe Stein, the Executive Director of the Maryland Humanities Council. Phoebe has devoted her career to education and the public humanities. As Executive Director, she directs the staff in providing over 800 free public programs each year, where activities include living history, literature, author programs, grant making, and humanities-based student competitions. The MHC is dedicated to reaching the entire state with its mission of stimulating and promoting civic dialogue on critical community issues. This One Maryland, One Book initiative is a shining example of the success of the Maryland Humanities Council's mission. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Phoebe Stein. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. I'm, we're just thrilled to be here tonight and to see all of you. Um, Phoebe's time, I'm the Executive Director of the Maryland Humanities Council, and I'm just so glad that each of you could join us for this special program with King Peggy, which is brought to you through a collaboration, as Dr. Stewart said, between the Maryland Humanities Council and our many wonderful local partners. I want to have a round of applause for the students who seated you and greeted you tonight in their beautiful, beautiful clothing. So glad to see so many students here tonight, and they certainly brightened up our, I'm wearing all black, right? Um, I wanna just uh, say a few words to welcome some special guests who are here with us tonight. Um, David Phillips is the chair of the Maryland Humanities Council board. He is sitting down here. He's also the acting dean of arts here at Montgomery College. Uh, another board member, Judy Morlata, is here, I believe. And also, I'm very happy to welcome one of our former board members, uh, Walter Leonard and his wife, Betty, are here, served on the council board for many years. Uh, a very special thank you to Karen McManus, who is here from Congressman Von Van Hollen's office. So thank you so much for being here. I just want to say a, just a couple of words about the Maryland Humanities Council. If you don't know us, we are a statewide nonprofit educational organization, and we provide a wide range of free programs around the state that all center around the humanities. This year's pick for our One Maryland, One Book fits beautifully with our mission, which is to use the humanities, literature, history, ethics, philosophy, poetry, to bring people together to talk about issues that are critical in our communities. And King Peggy certainly touches on many of these issues, particularly our shared responsibility in making our communities vibrant, welcoming, and livable. Montgomery County has shown a great enthusiasm for this annual program, and we have collaborated many times over the years with the college, and we are absolutely delighted to bring the One Maryland, One Book author to the Silver Spring campus tonight and to this beautiful, beautiful center that we're in. In addition to One Maryland, One Book, I just want to let you know that we have other programs. We have 11 other programs, and these include Maryland History Day and letters about literature contests for middle and high school students, we have a grants program, we give away money. And there are people who would love to answer the phone in our office. We have real live people who would like to talk to you. I'm happy to tell you more about our work tonight, uh, but please do call us or visit our website, which is mdhc.org. Uh, we also have a Speakers Bureau program, and some of you may be familiar with our Chautauqua Living History series, uh, where the performances take place at, our German, at your Germantown campus of Montgomery College each year. Um, 
I just want to say one small plug at the Maryland Humanities Council, we stretch our very modest resources as far as possible. And we do this to bring top notch programs like One Maryland, One Book and others to as many Maryland communities as possible. And as you can imagine, providing these free programs is a uh, hefty financial commitment for us. So I'm going to invite you today uh, to uh, participate and enjoy this program, but also consider making a small donation in the envelopes that are around. Um, we also have the ability to uh, take donations by cell phone. Uh, and you can see me about doing that. It's very simple for a $10 donation. So thank you in advance for your support. Um, you are, of course, at the heart of our programs. I uh, would be remiss if I didn't thank our uh, sponsors for One Maryland, One Book. The One Maryland, One Book project is generously funded statewide by the Institute of Museum and Library Services via the Division of Library Development and Services at the Maryland State Department of Education. Additional support is provided by the Alvin and Fannie B. Tallheimer Foundation, BG&E, and M&T Bank. And of course, I want to thank very much our local partners who have made tonight's uh, program possible. I want to thank the staff of Montgomery College, our wonderful tech folks, Dan and Chris, have been so helpful to us. Uh, particularly Siobhan Quinn, the director of the Cultural Arts Center here, um, of course, Dr. Stewart. Um, and I also want to thank Sarah Ducey of the Paul Peck Humanities Institute and the Office of Student Life. I want to say a special thank you to uh, Maisha Duncan, whose tireless work really made tonight's event possible. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Pearl uh, for being here tonight and for his support. So I know you're going to enjoy this, enjoy this program, and thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Phoebe. Now I'm very pleased to introduce my boss, the Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs here at Montgomery College, or King of Academic Affairs and the Humanities, uh, Dr. Don Pearl. Don? Good evening. Um, I'm here tonight to give uh, Dr. Pollard's speech. She's fighting a bad cold and some jet lag. She just came back from a trip to China, so she's going to spend tonight at home resting, and I've been asked uh, to, give this, uh, to deliver her remarks. So we'll have Dr. Pollard here in spirit as I give, her, give her, you her words. Good evening. What a wonderful reason to come together on a Friday night. I want to thank the Maryland Humanities Council for organizing One Maryland, One Book, as well as co-sponsoring King Peggy's visit. I also want to say a profound thank you to all the Montgomery College employees who had a role in making this evening happen, including those who work in our libraries, the Paul Peck Humanities Institute, Student Life, and the Cultural Arts Center, and of course, the Office of the Vice President and Provost here at Tacoma, Tacoma Park Silver Spring for hosting us. We are here tonight to be inspired. We are here tonight to celebrate diversity. We are here tonight to engage in thought-provoking dialogue. I would argue that all three of those reasons encapsulate what, a com what community colleges are all about. We are about empowering our students, enriching our community, and holding ourselves accountable. It is no coincidence that these three, those three principles happen to form our mission statement. What better way to actualize that mission than to hear from a king herself? A king herself. Now that is a powerful statement. If you look up king in the dictionary, the definition reads as something like, quote, the male ruler of an independent state, especially one who inherits the position by right of birth, or quote again, a boy or man who is highly respected and very successful and popular. Male, highly respected, successful. These are powerful standalone adjectives, yet I could not find one definition of a queen that included any such adjectives. Rather, they, the wife or widow of a king, or even a woman, or something personified as a woman, 
that is foremost or preeminent in any respect. As a general admirer of the power of words, I find it quite telling that the masculine version of the word for a sovereign leader includes words such as respected and successful, while they are conspicuously, conspicuously absent in the female version. Yes, I think the word king really is the better word to describe a king or a queen. There really is no better word than king to serve as an adjective of the highly respected and popular king here tonight. It is my great honor to tell you a little bit about the remarkable King Peggy, king of the town Otuma in Ghana, West Africa. After coming to the United States from Ghana to work more than 30 years ago, King Peggy received a, phone, uh, received a call one morning in 2008 that quite literally changed her life. It was her cousin calling to tell her that she was to be the next king of her ancestral village. Ever since, King Peggy has been a, quote, commuter king. She straddles two cultures and two continents. Splitting her time between working at the Ghana Embassy in the United States and as king of Otum in Ghana. Her mind is never far from her people. She is dedicated to ensuring access to simple yet critical necessities like clean water, health care, and schools to her village, access to education. That sounds familiar. A large part of King Peggy's mission is, in her own words, to bring empowerment to women, especially those in her hometown. Women are the lifelines of their families. They are the ones who feed the children. They are the ones who care for the sick. They must be the ones who bring education to the community. I quite agree with her that there ought to be more women to become kings like her. But really, she believes, and I concur, that we all have a little bit of a king in us. No matter your gender, your race, your origin, your religion, your sexual preference, you have a tremendous power. To quote King Peggy, you probably won't be a real king like me, but you could be a respected leader in your family, your workplace, and your community, bringing joy and comfort to many others. We are truly blessed to have King Peggy here this evening to share her special journey and inspiring story. Please join me in welcoming King Peggy. Thank you all very much. May you all please be seated. Good evening, faculty members, ladies and gentlemen, pastor. Good evening to you all. I'm very delighted to be here this evening to see such a crowd, beautiful people, after hard day's work, to come and see me. Who am I? Who am I? I thank you all very much. I'm going to interact with you tonight and tell you all about my journey. My private name is Peglin Bartels, but my school name is Nana Amua Afeni the Sixth. In the year 2008, my life changed to be who I am today. I still work as the embassy, as a secretary, and I love doing that. People ask me why, but I haven't finished my work at the embassy yet. In the year 2008, I was fast asleep. Because of the time difference in Ghana, when it's summertime, it's four hours ahead. When it's winter, it's five hours ahead. 
And in September month of 2008, I came from work. I was so tired. I remember I hoped that day I didn't even take my bath before I went to bed. And I was fast asleep. And I ran 4 o'clock. I received a call. The phone kept on ringing, kept on ringing. And I said to myself, I wasn't going to answer that phone. Because around that time of the night, receiving a call from Africa, either they want money <laughs> or somebody had passed on. And I was afraid to really, you know, pick up the phone. And then it kept on ringing, it kept on ringing. Then I said, I have to answer the phone. And I thought the person was going to ask me for money, so I was just going to answer with a very nasty inner voice so that the person would be off the phone. So I just said, hello. <laughs> and then the person said, Nana, started calling me Nana. And Nana is normally a name given to a woman who has, you know, any grandparent who had, you know, grandchildren, which I don't have children. So I'm not a grandmother. And also at that time, I wasn't a king because not kings and queens in Africa are also called Nana. So this my cousin on the line started calling me Nana, Nana. And I told him, I said, listen, it's 4 o'clock in the morning in the United States. Give it to me straight. What do you need now? How much? <laughs> and then he said, no, no, not yet. Then I said, then what is it? Then he said, you are the king of a Brazil royal family of Otuam. And I said, a king? Are you scamming me? Tell me straight. How much do you need? Because I want to go to bed. And then he said, Nana, your uncle the king had gone to a village and he's not coming back anytime soon. In Africa, our culture, when a king or a queen or any higher person passes on, they don't tell you straight that the person is dead. Especially with, among kings and queens, they tell you the king or the queen is going to his or her village and he or she is not coming back anytime soon. Then you know the person is gone. So when he said that, I was a little bit sad because then it reminded me of my mom when my mom passed away and they called me. And I said to myself, oh, my mother's side, they are all going, so now I'm getting old. Then I said, so the king is going to the village, why calling me now? And he said, Nana, we did all the rituals. We took 25 males because this is the first time that my family had really taken a woman, and even in the town, as a female king. And besides, in Africa, for a woman to be a king is unheard of. Because our men think the women are really there to make babies and cook and do things, and they have to do the hard work. So for a woman to be a king is unheard of. But now we have three of us, and I'm the third one. And I said, a king? What are you talking about? He said, we had 25 male. Normally, the family, they sit down with the elders, and then they have to pick up very nice, you know, morally minded person, very strong willed person, and then they would choose you as a king. But what they do is that they have a big room where they have all the stools with our ancestors' names. So in other words, if I pass on, my stool will be in that room. And then they have a drink called schnapps. They pour on it, and then they will mention your name. That, you know, you are, you've gone to your village, you all have gone to village, and we really want to somebody to succeed you. So we just, you know, have to, you know, choose this person. Then they will mention your name. We have got brown, and then they will pour the libation on all the chairs, the stools. And if, it has to steam up the vapor of this, uh, the, uh, the stool. Because it's in a very warm room, it has to really vapor. But if it doesn't, then it means you are not the one. And they have all these 25 male, very educated, morally good, very respectable people. Because as you are growing in the family, they watch your behavior. They watch your behavior. And I was the person that was on the last list. And I said, why did they put me on the last list? They said, we don't know. So they mentioned all the 25 names, nothing happened. And then I was the last one. They mentioned my name, and they pour all the liquor, and then it started vaporing up. 
So my elders were shocked, and they started looking at each other. So they did it three times. <laughs> why they did it three times, I don't know. So I asked them, why three times? They said, no, no, we don't know. We just don't understand. I said, you better understand, because I'm here to rule. <laughs> So when he told me that, and I said, okay, because in Africa, you know, uh, to be a king in a little town, I have 7,000 people, you have to really better the lives of the people. It's not like the European monarchies where everything is really on a, a silver platter for you. And here is a woman in the United States, and we all know secretaries, we don't make much money. I have my own bills to pay. I have my little, you know, condo fee, my, my condo that I have to pay my mortgage. How am I going to, you know, better the lives of 7,000 people? So I told him, I said, go and tell them. I have to think about it. And then he said, they told me to tell you they were giving you only three days to think about it. I said, no problem. So I went back to bed, and I was thinking. I said, how am I going to lead with the little money I have? I don't want to really, you know, uh, disappoint them. Whilst I was really pondering on this thing for three days, Something beautiful happened to me. And I hope and pray that someday something like this will happen to some of you in this room when you are worthy to take a calling. I started hearing voices in my living room, in my car. At first, I thought I was going you know, mad. I, I thought I was losing my mind. Because of working hard, I was working hard, and I thought maybe I was working hard. The voice is neither a male or a female. And he keep on telling me, Nana, it's your destiny. It's not every day that a woman is born to be a king. Go and lead, and people are out there to help you. Then I said, what's going on? And I looked around in my living room, everywhere in my kitchen. Even when I'm sleeping, I'll be hearing the voices. By then, I was driving my 1992 Honda Accord. And normally, I don't go through the main street during rush hour, because I don't want to be nuisance on the road in case, you know, it breaks down. <laughs> so normally, I go through the creek. At least, if it breaks down, I'll be with there with the deer, and uh, <laughs> we can have fun. And then there's a ravine, you know, on the side of the uh, creek. Anytime I reach there, the voice will be so deep, and say, Nana, it's your destiny. Go for it. It's not every day that a woman is born to be a king. Go and lead and help your people. People are out there to help you. It went on for three days. And then on the third day, I parked the car at the side and said, who am I? Who am I? If I have to go and lead my people, whoever you are, I have accepted the calling, and I'll go and lead my people. As soon as I said that, my whole body was like they have poured some cold water on me. And then I was happy inside me, very content, for really accepted the calling. I took off, I went to office, I parked my car, and even my walking was like zombie. I couldn't walk well, like my feet was full of arthritis or something. I couldn't lift my feet. And I said, what's going on? Then I went to my office, I sat down, and then when my boss came, I went to his office and said, I have something to tell you. And then he said, what have you done now? <laughs> because in the office, they know me that when you step on my feet, and you you even if you try to take one of my toe, I will make sure that I take your whole toes and your legs. <laughs> so, you know, my boss thought I have done something, and then I'm coming to report myself before they report me. And I said, no, I haven't done anything. This your secretary is, been going, is going to be a king. And he said, a king? Are you OK? <laughs> Are you all right? Do I have to call an ambulance for you, or you want to go home and rest? I said, I'm OK. Then he said, OK, go and have a seat. I'll call you back. I went and sat down. And he called me back again. He said, are you OK? And I said, listen, Mr. Ambassador, if I'm not OK, I would have put salt in your coffee. I'm OK. Then he said, don't start with me now. You are not a king yet. 
so go ahead and have a seat. I did. And then he called me the third time, and then when I came, he said, if it's true that you're going to be a king, you are going to be a very good one because you run my office very, very well. And I said, you should have told me this from the beginning. <laughs> and then I said, I will need 10 days to go home for my coronation. And at that time, our former president of Ghana was coming. So he told me to wait till he comes and leaves. So I said, OK, no problem. After he came and left, I was given the 10 days. And I went to Ghana. And when I was going, I thought I was going to be in a Bentley car or a long limousine. <laughs> and you know, people would be driving me and everything. Lo and behold, when I went, they came with a portable car, but I was fine with it. And the road to my village was bumpy ride. I really suffered before I got home. And when I got home, it was night. And then my elders showed me the palace. And I said, this palace is not good enough for anyone to sleep there. They said, Nana, that's what the palace look like. Can you find me another place? And then I have a cousin that has a house. It wasn't that of a really, really high quality, but at least it was comfortable. And I was adjusted to it very easily. So I went and spent the night. And when I went, I saw everybody, my cousins, my aunties, brothers and sisters, with the exception of my mom. My mom was not there, because my mom had gone. And then I started crying. And they said, Nana, we are here to help you. And your mom, wherever your mom is, is also going to help you. And then they said, about 10 elderly women going to sleep with me in one warm bedroom. And I said, what is this? <laughs> and they said, Nana, our culture, this is a big task that you are going to really take. And we have to protect you mentally, physically, spiritually, and also to really tell you what to do and what not to do. And I said, OK, I'll try to sleep with you all, but you have to sleep on the floor whilst I sleep on the bed. And they said, yes, that's what we're going to do. And I was happy to be with them in the room, even though it was not comfortable, but I tend to enjoy it because they really taught me a lot while we were in the room. They taught me how to walk, how to say things in the public, and what not to do. And the part that got me so mad was they told me, do not argue in the public. And also, if somebody even slaps you, don't slap back. I said, what? <laughs> I said, is that what the kinship is all about? They said, nobody will slap you if you really do what we are telling you. I said, OK, but you know, every now and then I do argue a little bit you know, in a corner in my office. So after that, they said, we have to really start the coronation. And you know, normally, they put you in a room for 10 days because they don't want to see a very skinny king. So they have to feed you, they bathe you and everything. They don't even want me to bathe myself. And then they bring nice, you know, good food and everything. And I was already chubby, so I wasn't really <laughs> worried about the food. So after that time, they took me out, carried me in a nice palanquin, and then they showed me to the town for about an hour. It was quite an hour but they tend to change me every five minutes. I thought I was going to be dropped because the people carrying me were so thin and I was so heavy and I had to dance. So you can imagine how heavy it was. After that, they took me home. And then one night we were sleeping. You know, I forgot to tell you all that during the coronation, merrymaking, I thought they were going to really buy the drinks and the food. They kept on asking me, Nana, we need money for chicken. <laughs> and I said, what is the money in the family coffers? Because we have a um, you know, fishing village where you collect the fees. Then the men shrug their shoulders as if they don't know where the money is. They, of course they know where the money is. They misspend it. So I said, OK. Anytime they come, I remember when I was growing up, my mom taught me that if you have money, and you don't want anybody to get it. You put it in a handkerchief and you put it right here. You are the only person who can go there. 
So I went with my dollars, and that's why I put it. So when they come to get money, I tell them, turn your head over the other side. I'm coming. Then I'll bring the money and give it to them. So we had a very good time, and then I did all what I have to do to make the thing very successful. And after that, one day, I was asleep, and something told me to wake up. I woke up and I looked through the window, and then I saw two little children. It was four in the morning, having some bucket of water on their head. So I woke one of my aunties and I said, what's going on? He said, Nana, we don't have running water in the uh, town. And besides, they drink from a stream that you wouldn't even dare give it to your enemy. And I said, wow, that stream, they use it for bathing, they use it for washing, they use it for cooking, they use it for drinking. They don't even boil it. And sometimes you see some little frogs in it. They would take the frog out and they would drink it, just like that. And I saw that the little children had a little stomach. We call it koshyokor. And then they have you know, red blood on their eyes from drinking that water. I got sad and I said, I have to do something about it because I really came from a country that they are well developed and I have learned a lot. And why would I come here to be a king and see my people drinking such water and the children suffering to wake up four o'clock in the morning to go and fetch water before going to school, whereby they sleep in the classroom without reading or doing anything? I told my aunties, I said, I'll do something about it. So when I finished everything, and I also realized that there were some children roaming about in the beaches without going to school. In Ghana especially, every parent's dream is for a child to go to a private school. They can't afford it. So they were just not even going to public school or doing anything. They were roaming about and doing nothing. I was really hurt. I said, this is a child. I don't want their life to be wasted. Because even in this modern world, somebody may have master's or PhD, and sometimes it's very difficult for them to make it and even to get jobs. So does that mean that these children are going to be roaming about for the rest of their life? So I told my aunties, I said, I'll see the best I can do. So after that, then I realized also my family, the men had spent all the money. When you ask them, they shrug their shoulders. My 10 days was up, so I told them, I said, I'm going, and I'm going and come back, and you all are going to really see the real king. So when I got back, it was a big thing in the Washington Post, and then all of a sudden, I prayed and I said, whoever the voice was, God, help me, because this is what I saw during my coronation. I don't want to fail them. And after I prayed, within two or three days, I received a call from a church called Shallow Baptist Church of Landover, Maryland, with the leadership of Pastor B. Lewis Colleton, who is with us tonight, called and said, they want to come and see me. And I said, what have I done to the church people now that they want to come and see me? <laughs> so they came, and then we had a talk. It was a beautiful talk. They told me they had also prayed to find a place in Africa to help them. And when they saw my article, they realized that this is the person they want to help. So they want to give me a covenant that would tell me they're going to help my town. At first, I thought. <laughs> at first, I thought they were kidding. Or they were just coming to scam me or something. So the pastor came. And then on Sunday, I went to the church. Lo and behold, I was given the covenant. And I've been traveling with them since then to Ghana every year. And they are doing a lot. So when I went the following year, I had a big meeting with my family. And I told them, I said, I want to meet all the men. The men were laughing at me, even though I am chosen. And they are the people who chose me through the rituals. So while we're having the big meeting, one of them stood up and said, you are a woman, sit down for us to tell you 
what's to do? Then I said, oh, no. I'm a chosen and I'm a king. I'm here to rule and to help you all. So you shut up and sit down. <laughs> and for some reason, he sat down like a baby. <laughs> and they said, you know, we have to be careful with this American woman because we know that they have guns. <laughs> <laughs> if you are not careful, he's going to blow our heads off. So let's be quiet and sit down and listen to him, to her. So we had a very good meeting. We started the meeting from 4 in the morning till 8 at night. I really had. I really worked hard. And I told them, we're going to have a bank in the town. And they said, no, 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 no. Don't bring American style to this village. I said, savings has nothing to do with American style. Whether you like it or not, I'm going to open the bank. We had a big fight, and I won. And I was able to open up the bank for them. And then the following year, Shallow Baptist Church and good people of the United States helped me to bring about clean water to the town. <laughs> At the moment, I have seven clean borehole water for the town. <laughs> Shallow Baptist Church and its congregation and good people from the United States had helped me to also bring about 50 children that we are really educating them so that they can be blessed in the future. We give them food when we go there for a feeding program because a child going to school without eating do not have an energy to study. So when we go, we normally give them 50 pounds bag of rice, tomato paste, and gallon, big gallons of oil and money to buy fish to cook for the children before they go to school. And we just do that for the whole year. We just give them money for the whole year. And they are really doing well by it. And also I realized that women in my town were being intimidated to a point that they don't even have to dance when there is a merrymaking. And if they need something, they have to wait for their husbands or their boyfriends to come. And I made it a point to really empower them. So last year, we had 100 black coalition women of California that they sent their representative with money to help us to give the, each woman at least $300 to really open up their own kiosk or whatever they want to do, it's a loan for them to really be able to do something. Because I told them, I told the woman, I said, you don't have to wait for a man to come before you be complete. You may not have a husband. Even if you have a husband, you have to help. What about if your husband loses his job or if something happens to your husband? How are you going to take care of the children? You also have to do something to bring food to the table. So please, we're going to do this. At first, the men were not happy about it. They said, oh, here come United States woman. He's, she is coming to really you know, ruin our lives. The women are going to have money and they won't respect us. And that's not true. I told them, I said, that's not true. They will respect you, but let them also have their own financial you know, situation where they can be comfortable. When you are not around, she will also be able to help. So now we have empowered the women. Some of them have their own little kiosk. They're baking bread. They're selling donuts. They're going to the fishing village to get fish and then smoke it and go to the bigger cities to sell them. And also one thing I saw was that my clinic was not good. And also when a woman goes to have a child, they normally put a cloth on the floor put water on it and deliver the baby, and sometimes the baby's head may hit the ground, and they have to really carry the baby to bigger cities, and they don't make it, they take taxis. Last year, we were able to have a fundraising, and we were able to buy them an ambulance, which we took it last year. <laughs> also, Shiloh Baptist Church and its congregation last year went with 2,000 uh, toothpaste and brushes, to help the children how to be very hygienic with their mouths before going to school. So they helped them last year with all that. And also we had eye doctors that they went with us and they showed them how to, they came and they tested their eye 
and some of them were really having problems with their eyes without even seeing. So they helped them also. So it means within the few period that I have been a king, I have been able to achieve a lot. And now I'm beginning to realize that the voice was telling me the truth. But I don't know what kind of person the person is. Whether it's my ancestors, it's God, my angel. But in this world, I realize we all have a calling. And you can either receive it early or in the late time. But when it comes, please be worthy and ready to accept it because you can really do it. And besides, I do not want any woman to think, I'm a woman, I can't do it. We can do it. If we can really deliver babies, you can get pregnant for nine months, even though I haven't been pregnant before. But I realize what they go through to have the babies. We can do it. So I'm going to show you a few of the things that I have done for the village. And after that, you can ask me questions, and I'll be ready to answer all the questions for you all. Where the red arrow is pointing is Ghana. It's one of the countries in the continent of Africa. And I'm along the coastal area at the bottom because my town is L-shaped in the central region of Ghana. And you know, the same way you come to the town is the same way you go out. So when you come to Ghana and to come to my town and cause commotion in my town, they will chase you from the same place you came and the same place out. <laughs> These are the women that the men were you know, really, really serious about intimidating them before. They don't even allow them to even marry making when we are having a festival, and I told them, I said, love us whilst you have us. Don't intimidate us. They're really going to be merrymaking like you all because we cook for you all to eat. We bear children for you all. We do a lot for you. Don't intimidate us. So now the women are also happy, and they also enjoy themselves when there's a merrymaking in the town. That's my mom the woman who made me who I am today. I remember when I was growing up, my mom used to wake me up every morning and said, let me tell you something. Do not let anybody tell you you can't do it. You can do it. You are a special woman and be strong and morally be strong. So when my father divorced my mom, we left the town that we were to another village. Actually, it wasn't a village, it was a town called Takaradi. My mom did a lot for us. We were 10 of us. And this woman was so strong. And then one day, she woke me up and said, my daughter, you are so attached to me, and I'm afraid that if I don't let you out of this country, and if anything happens to me, you become stupid. At first, I thought my mom doesn't love me anymore. I cried and cried, both of us cried. And she said, I realize you like good food. I'll let you go to England and study catering and come back to be a caterer. Of course I love food, so I was happy in a way. <laughs> but I was sad that I was leaving my mom. And truly speaking, she took me to England. So that's the woman who made me who I am today. I wish she's around today for me to really also let her know how very well and how happy I am for how she had made me to be, but she's not around. So I pray for her every day, every day. And that's my mom. That's my younger brother. He comes really after me. He's in Australia now. And in Africa, on Sundays, we, go, we tend to go to church. If you don't go to church, you'll be eating leftovers. But if you go to church on Sundays, you'll be given nice, you know, like a rice and chicken and stuff like that. And this, my younger brother doesn't like going to church. And he had everybody to go to church and thinking that he was going to go with me and he said he wasn't going. So I took him to the back of the house, beat the hell out of him. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see we had a big fight at the back of the house. So both of us have blanket faces because I really whacked him so hard. And that's me, when I came first from England, we had a reception at the embassy. I came in and this man used to be my father's friend. 
and then he was an ambassador, and he said he was looking for a secretary, even though I had said it to become a caterer, and he said, you know, we want you to take the job. So I went back to England, and I came, and there was a reception, and then it was very successful. So after that, I went to him and talked to him how, the success, how successful the reception was. So it's me and the ambassador talking. That's me in my little office at the embassy. In case I knew I was going to be a king someday, I would have covered my ties. <laughs> but, uh, but it's okay. This is my town, my L-shaped town. On top there, you see Methodist Church up there. And the women that we have empowered, some of them had even had kiosks where they're selling minerals called sodas over here. And then they, some of them are selling donuts, bread, and few things that they're really doing for themselves. That's me when I was installed in my palanquin, that I was really scared that I was going to die, you know, or they were going to throw me down. But I was able to survive up there. And that's me. And this long girl, you saw that someone was sitting in front of the palanquin with me. They said she's my soul because they have a notion that in Africa, when you become a leader, especially a female leader, they have all kinds of eyes on you, good eyes, bad eyes. But when they come, the bad ones, and they see a young girl sitting in front of you, a virgin, then they leave you alone. So that's my soul. And that's my Chiami, the linguist who talks to the stool, who pour the libation because he understands the language of the stool, which I don't. I'm trying to you know, figure out how I can understand the language eventually. And also, if there's a big festival and there's food for me to eat, he has to taste it first. If he doesn't pass out, then I can also eat it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my fishing village. Some of them do have money to buy lumber to you know, fix up a boat, a canoe, where they use it for fishing. So some of them are getting ready to go fishing early in the morning. Those who doesn't have money to you know, buy lumber to build up a canoe, they have a fish dread, net dragon where they throw the net in the uh, sea around uh, 4 in the morning, and then 9 o'clock they go and drag the fish that had come into the net. So I'm also trying as much as possible in the future to help them also to be able to have money to buy lumber to build up their canoes, because this kind of thing is very hard for them. This woman is one of the women that we have empowered, that he normally, she normally goes to the fishing village to buy fish, clean it, and smoke it, and then go to the towns to sell them. So she's now happy that she can also do something for the family. That's my Chiami. He is 89 years old, but he tends to also have his own farm where he really has um, pineapple that he's bringing me some for breakfast. Even though he's bringing it, he still have to taste it first before I taste it. That's my beautiful palace I inherited. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? It's a beautiful palace. I love it. <laughs> this is where I stayed, you know, since I said I couldn't stay in that palace. I think this is better than my palace. So this is where I stayed with my uh, aunties. This is the water that they used to drink. They bathe in it. They do everything with this water. You can see that you can't even give this water to your own enemy, but they were drinking it. And even since I brought the water to the town, the elders of the town still said they want to drink this water because they've been drinking it for years, and I'm bringing clean water to kill them. So they, they don't drink it much, but the younger ones, the younger generations, tend to drink the good water. That is when I went with CBS News. They even aired it on a Sunday morning news of, uh, in uh, year 2008. They came with me, and then they brought the water, and they were trying to see the little frogs that I was talking about. And I couldn't stand there to watch it. So they were just, you know, really interviewing the people that they drink the water. These are the, some of the girls that they used to go and get water before they go to school. You can never do that in the United States, asking somebody to go and get water at 4 o'clock before going to school. 
So, you know, the people, the children here are really lucky, and I hope they take their studies very seriously and respect their parents for what they are doing for them. These are the children that they were suffering to go and get water. These are some of the children that they used to roam about in the villages, and they're always laughing. So one day, I asked them, how come you're not going to school and you're always laughing? And then they said, Nana, we don't have much, but we are always happy. This is some of the girls, that's uh, the children that the Shallow Baptist Church and people from United States have really helped them to be in school. In Ghana, most of the schools do have uniforms because they don't want it to be like a competition where the children have to really dress, you know, to go to school and sometimes they will say, oh, my shoe is not good and they were laughing at me and all that. They all wear the same, you know, uh, dress. And this is me when we opened the bank. I opened the bank with my own first money, and I have really had the bank in the town for them, where they have to really save their money. This is me at the Shallow Baptist Church of Landover, Maryland, and that's Pastor Colleton. Under his leadership, I was able to give the covenant that when they were said they were going to help me. And this is me when we're trying to open one of the borehole water and that's a Chiami, and that's my brother that I used to beat. Now he's an adult, and that's me there, watching how they pour in the libation to thank God and the people that had helped us to have good people in the United States and the church to help us to bring about water for the town. This is one of the water, the first water that was brought about that, you know, we really... And we have seven of them. And in my town, we don't have a secondary school, which is a high school. My school goes up to the ninth grade. And after that, the children have to travel. The parents that can afford to continue with their children's education, they have to really travel to bigger cities. And most of the times, the girls go there, they come back home pregnant because they are not used to bigger cities, and they really you know, exploit them. And they come back home, you know, being pregnant, new husband, and education is wasted. So we're trying to bring about, you know, high school in the village. So Shallow Baptist Church is trying to find sponsors to help them to bring about secondary school in the town. So we went to one of the executives to really know the logistics of how to bring about, you know, secondary school in the town. So that's where we went, and then the Shallow Baptist Church and its pastor went with me to see the person, and they have given us a go-ahead to build a secondary school, so we are still looking for sponsors to help us. That's my co-author, Miss Diamond, which has already uh, sponsored two children, and these are the two children that, you know, she's sponsoring. This is last year when we went with eye doctors, that they are also, you know, sizing their eye and see what's going on and helping them to get glasses. That's Ms. Diamond again helping with the eyeglasses. This woman is, you know, really laughing so hard because uh, he, she said she hasn't been seeing things for a very long time. And all along, you know, they said there is a king, and she knows that, you know, the king is a man. So when she had the eyeglasses on and saw me, she couldn't help laughing. <laughs> That's my beautiful palace again. This is how I've renovated it too. I suffered a lot within the first few years of my kinship. I have to eat chicken wings and drink water to really send money all the time. It screwed me up big time. And, uh, but uh, I've been able to have it this far and I have a few things to do, and then I know I'm going to do it for me to be able to stay there next year. This is the ambulance we took to them last year. And since the ambulance has been in the village, every morning I'll see this goat <laughs> standing there. I don't know whether the goats want us to take it to the hospital or something, <laughs> but this is the ambulance we have given to the town. That's the inside of the ambulance. So now they are really free to really have it to go to hospital. But they have to pay just a little money for
for the gas and then the driver and for the maintenance of the car. And these are the women that we went and then we are trying to empower them. So the women are in the palace and the palace and then um, the pastor and I were talking to them how we're going to divide the money for them to be empowered. And these are the uh, toothpaste brushes and the uh, toothpaste that the Charlotte took last year to help the children. So they have really formed a line and then one of the uh, church members is trying to talk to them and help them how to use it. But I heard that some of them have really put it in their house and they eaten it like candy. <laughs> and this woman is one of my councilwomen because um, when I was having a battle, I really fired most of the men. And she is one of the strongest you know, women that is really you know, helping me right now in my council. And she is the one that really communicates with me a lot whilst I'm here. Tell me things, and I tell her things to tell the men. When I took over in 2008, these people, whenever I call them for a meeting, the men think that I'm a woman, I can't do it, so they don't come. Only few people do come. But now they realize they can do it. So now they come in abundance. Even when they are drunk, they still come. <laughs> and here I'm talking to them about issue. There was a marital issue that was going on because when I go to Ghana, I had to really you know, uh, tackle some issues about land and you know, marital problems. The only thing that I can't really tackle is when someone kills somebody. That one, they have to take you to the court. But other than that, minor, minor things, I really mediate and do things about it. So I was having some uh, few issues with them over here. So that's my journey, being King Peggy. Ladies and gentlemen, we will have a very short question and answer period. There are two microphones. Each one is located near the stage. If you have any questions that Excuse may have me, a question, before can ask. we go on, uh, if Pastor Collison is here, can you please pastorize up for the people to see you and to let you, them know how good you are helping us? Is Pastor here? Right there. <laughs> James Murray. Hi, my name is James Murray. Uh, if if your, your village was looking for someone with the knowledge and temperament to lead, it's not surprising they chose you. You had gone to London and educated yourself, did the same thing over here, had a long career in a diplomatic mission. But my question is, you, while you were working in the embassy, you had an unusual amount of access to models of leadership. And I'm wondering if that informed your leadership in Otwam at all. I can say that, um, not necessarily, but being in the United States and what I have learned being here is what had helped me. So it's not necessarily being in the embassy, but it's what I have seen and how people in the United States do things really had helped me a lot. It has strengthened me to be able to lead. I just interested to know, what is your next step for your town and your... My town doesn't have a laboratory at the moment. They may have it at home. But I'm trying to bring about a laboratory where if any of the people in the United States try to come to my town to see the place, and if they want to use the bathroom, they will have a place to go. So that's my next step. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> uh, hello, King Peggy. Um, in the book, you uh, mentioned that you got a lot of the corruption taken care of. There are a lot of you know, mismanagement of funds. and. Um, since you've cleaned it up, how's things now? I mean, things are really good because now we have the bank, and um, most of the men, I made them to know that we have to really deposit the money to help people. So that's what we do now. So most of the corruption had really, you know, gone out of it, unless they are doing something that I don't know. But if I get to know, I will address it. I'm, I was told by my uh, students, my middle school students, to ask you, why are you called a king and not a queen? 
You know, it's like a woman being a, becoming a president. You wouldn't change the title. You call the woman Madam President. Even though it's a male-dominated title, it's the same thing here. I'm a woman that they have really blessed me with a male-dominated you know, dominated title. They can't call me queen. I'm a king. And besides, king in my town really had all the power to the executive thing. The queen really gather all the data, especially with the children, and then tell the king to really act on it. So I can see myself being with my very strong personality, and if I was chosen a queen and collected the data for the king, and he doesn't act on it, I'll kill him. <laughs> <laughs> You're Good welcome. <laughs> Good evening, and thank you so much for coming. We are all so excited to have you here. I have several students, and we just finished dealing with linguistics and the meaning of words. And I was explaining to them that, you know, the king title has so much power where the queen title doesn't. So the question that he just brought up was one that I was going to ask you to expand on about uh, how we need to understand how words are powerful and because you have that title, people must respect you, whereas with the queen title, they would not. And that this is a global phenomenon and that we need to understand that. So I was going to ask you to say more about that. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, Nana. Good to see you again. Thank you for coming to Montgomery College. I have a question about how you enforce certain rules or policies or regulations you put in place when you're not there. Um, you showed us the lady that kind of lets you know what go what's going on when you're not there, but do you have anybody or people that you put in place as like police or anything like that in addition to what, you know, the Ghanaian government would have in any given locality? Um, who do you have to help you do your, your bidding or your supervising while you're away? Actually, I used to have a regent that uh, used to help me, but for some reason, he just quit. And then this woman is the one that I have. But you know, um, I do pray a lot that nothing serious you know, should happen whilst I'm here. And beside my town, we have police station, but they, they, they don't do anything because there's no crime in the town. The only crime in the town is for a, a man to drink and misbehave, and then they'll put the person there for about a day, and he come back sober. So <laughs> I think uh, I have it covered, and the woman is the one that I really have right now. So we'll take this one and maybe one more. We want to be sure we allow enough time for you to get your books signed. So we'll have this one. This may be the final question. Good evening. Thank good evening, King good, Peggy. Good evening. I had an opportunity to, to bring my nine-year-old daughter here with me. What words of wisdom could you give to a nine-year-old in America with regards to education? A male? Female. Female. Um, all that I can say is that they have a long years ahead of them. They have to respect their parents, study hard, and be bold in a very positive way, and pray and they will succeed in life. All right, well, thank you all so much for coming. If you can get one more round of applause for King Peggy. And on this note, I will say, I thank you all very much for coming. I live in Silver Spring. I was once a student in Montgomery College, and uh, I love you all very much for taking time to come and see me. May God bless each and every one of you. And also, a movie will be coming out next year. Queen Latifah will be playing me in the movie. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I thank you all. May God bless you all and drive home safely till we meet again in the future. <laughs> <laughs>